So very welcome to this third lecture of a series of eight lectures called Recognizing Islam and Muslims in Europe and North America. There's a folder lying here. Some of you have already seen it from before. Yeah. Looks like this. It's available here. Oh, if you need a copy when you leave. My name is Jonas Otterbeck. I'm a professor here at the Aga Khan University, Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. And um, I have a long, long history uh, with Jorgen Nilsson or Jörn Nilsson. Uh, he's a Dan it is the same person. It is the same person here. Jörn Nilsson is the Danish part of him, and Jorgen Nilsson is the British part of him. And as he grew up both in Britain and uh, in, in uh, did I say German? I said Danish, I meant. Uh, he broke, grew up both in Denmark and in London, actually. So welcome back to London. Uh, the first time I met Jörn was in 1993, and then he gave me some really good advice. And I met him again in 2000 at my public defense. We have public defenses in Sweden where I defended my dissertation, and Jörn was my opponent, and he gave me the same advice, actually. But I had already followed it, which I was pretty satisfied with. Uh, over the years, I've been running into uh, Jörn Nilsson, and wait a minute. And you do that if you are in the field of uh, Islam in Europe studies. You can't avoid Jörn Nielsen. You shouldn't avoid Jörn Nielsen. He's been the inspiration for, for quite a few scholars over the years. Uh, I'll return to you in a minute. But the, these lectures, uh, the first lecture was by uh, Professor Garby Schmidt. And she reminded us of the importance of recognizing the Muslim presence as not new, which is often presumed. She talked about 150 years of Muslim presence in Denmark. She also addressed how Islam and Muslims have become involved in grassroots politics and have become part of Danish nationalist politics in a rather unwanted way. The second lecture by assistant professor Michael Mohammed Knight took us to the United States of America and presented the growth of the five percenters or the nation of gods and earth, which they also call themselves, and gave us a glimpse of their central ideas. In both cases, the very title of the lecture series was touched upon by the speakers, asking us both to recognize, sort of to note and to accept the thoughts and lives of people who relate in different ways to Islam. And interestingly, some of these are non-Muslims who relates to Islam, for example, Danish politicians who interpret Islam through their political debate. And they do things with that thing that we generally call Islam. And when it comes to the five percenters, they generally don't call themselves Muslims. Well, some do, but most of them don't. But they consider that what they're doing is Islam. So we have all these different perspectives coming together, and this is what we want to expose with the lecture series, actually, and that's why it's called Recognizing them, Islam. To see, to find Islam in different places, unexpected places sometimes, possibly expressions that you haven't met before, expressions that you haven't really thought about, scholarly about, and uh, expressions that you might not even consider Islamic, but by the people who um, develop the faith, they might consider it Islamic. Other people might not be Muslims and might not even aspire to do things theologically with Islam, but they might still affect. So we are recognizing that kind of diversity, paying attention to trends, situations and phenomena that researchers maybe haven't focused enough on. This evening, Jörn Nilsson or Jorgen Nilsson will discuss the rather new situation in Germany uh, where they now have Islamic studies as a theological field at universities that is situated at German university. There are now employed faculty who are employed to interpret Islam. 
Jürgen Nilsson is uh, Emeritus Professor of Contemporary European Islam. He's a pioneer, as I told you, in the study of Muslims in Western Europe. And he had put, for example, the Center for the Study of Islam and Christian Muslim Relations, say Lyok, in Birmingham on the map. He's been instrumental to many researchers and he's also been uh, part of starting maybe the most important series about Muslims in Europe. For example, the Brill series, Muslim Minorities, and the Year Book of Muslims in Europe also. His own books include Muslims in Western Europe, for example, one of the few scholarly bestsellers in the field, and I think the only book on Islam in Europe that has been produced in four editions. Most are produced in one edition. Now, I could, from this best shift that was written to Jan Nielsen, essays in honor of Jan Nielsen, I could do like this and start reading on page 30 and continue reading for 10 pages about his publications in small print. But I don't think you want me to do that. But there are 10 pages of in, in this bibliography of his. Um, so I will not mention more than that about it. But uh, we have, during these lectures, started with a short discussion. And we're going to do that today also. So I have a couple of prepared questions for Jürgen that I'll turn to now. And after that, you will hear his lecture. He forgot to mention that he is the co-author of the fourth edition of the book. <laughs> well, that was just because you were too lazy to have updated. Precisely. <laughs> and nagged him about that. Please, my student thinks it's too old now, but I want to use it. So, like, update it. You do it. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this topic that you've chosen, why is it fascinating? I mean, this is not generally what you have been working on. So chosen a new topic now. It, it arises out of teaching experience since the end of the 70s, um, teaching Islamic studies uh, at MA level and more recently at BA level as well, until I went to Damascus in 2005. Um, because certainly um, in the Birmingham University situation, uh, when we started the BA in Islamic Studies, um, the vast majority of students were Muslims from the Birmingham area. Prior to that, when I've been teaching, and still most of my work over the years have been teaching postgraduates, masters and PhDs, and the vast majority of them were Muslim students of Islamic Studies from Islamic faculties in the Muslim world. So I've been involved in graduating possibly as many as 40 PhDs from Malaysia, six from the University of Jordan, 12 from the University of Kuwait. And I find myself as a non-Muslim who is interested in Islamic thinking, um, essentially in supervising these students, becoming a partner in, in Islamic Ijtihad, which is a fascinating position to be in. Um, and you know, these students, I don't remember whether I touched on that in the lecture, but in case I don't. Um, these students come from educational cultures where they're expected to agree with the teacher. But if you're doing an MA or a PhD as a Muslim student from the Islamic Studies faculty in the Muslim world, and you come and have me as your supervisor, by definition, you can't agree with me because I'm not a Muslim. So we start off from the very beginning in a kind of mutually questioning relationship. So what am I teaching? Am I teaching Islam to Muslims? Or am I teaching a non-Muslim view of Islam to Muslims? Am I absorbing what they are, what they're working with into my teaching, my understanding of Islam? Or am I teaching research method where in a sense, Superficially, the belief system is irrelevant, but you know very well that however much you 
work on research method with research students, you cannot cut that research method off from the subject that the students are working with. So I find myself, I've, I've found myself over the years in this constant toing and throwing with, with students, and especially in the UK or generally European situation, of course, where we're getting more and more Muslim students into our classes, um, we are having to deal with that challenge. And it was really, it really was brought home to me in Denmark, when the six years I was at the University of Copenhagen, where I ran across a, what I would say, more traditional academic culture, um, which insisted that teaching and research method had to be in the critical European tradition with no regard to where the student came from in terms of belief systems and world and worldview. So I mean I was provoked into that over those years ago. Oh, I'm curious about this instead. Uh, do you, I mean is, is a pattern produced then? Can you see that the students that you've had, they, they tend to grasp something from you when they put in their Islam that is common regardless of where they come from. Some do, some don't. I mean, the one thing I've learned is that you just, one, you just cannot generalize. And we have a tendency as research academics, whatever subject we're researching, we have a tendency to treat it as if it has developed up to now. End of story. But what we're dealing with here, we're in the middle of a process. And what we're dealing with here is as much a potential for the future as something that has developed over the past. So half the time when I'm engaged in a discussion with a Muslim research student, I'm thinking the potentials as much as I'm thinking of the past and the actual text in front of us. And my Danish colleagues have difficulty dealing with that. In what way? They were stuck in the traditional system of, system of learning and research. You take the point up to now, all that other stuff is futurology, it's guesswork, it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. And if you choose to interpret, to, to read a Quranic passage or an Islamic argument in terms of, look, that could possibly lead in that direction. That's not the business of a research academic. So, so in a way, we, um, what you're doing then is, is taking a different stance to knowledge production. So mm -hmm. not in, in, like the Danish colleagues that you have, they, they would say that there is one knowledge production that is important. It's supposed to look like this. These are the Danish knowledge. colleagues that he knows. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and they would then say that, okay, and all, all the rest of study material, mm -hmm. what you're saying is that it's not clear cut. Yeah. We can't make that division anymore. You can't make that division. There is no set closing point of an argument. We're in the middle of an argument, and um, that the, the, the process has to be taken from the past through the now to the future. And that led you to studying German universities and their No, that came. Studies. I mean, what then triggered that, that the, the German development then triggered uh, my thinking about this quite specifically, because in a German academic environment suddenly uh, founding Islamic theology departments. There were big arguments in the German academic uh, superstructure about this when it happened, which I'll touch on. I can imagine now we want to hear more about it now. So please right. give okay. an incident and a half. Yeah, it's more than a dozen years ago now that the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research attracted headline attention when it announced that it was going to spend around 18 million euros over five years on the establishment of programs of Islamic theology in five universities. That was 
is that the five-year financing has been renewed since, um, and all five university departments, you're talking about 13 professorships here. And if you know what a German professorship is, it's rather different from a professorship here. A German professorship is not only the professor and the financing of that, it's also the financing of three or four younger teaching and research staff around him. It's, it's a professor seminar, as the Germans call it. So it's so if you have a department that suddenly gets three of these professorships, they've suddenly got 10 more academic staff. The Germans do things thoroughly. I shall come back to that later, but very quickly survey the development of Islamic studies as an academic discipline in Europe generally. Um, so that you know where, what we're doing today, where it comes from. Britain was one of the countries where change first took place in the current developments. And it's one of the places where Islamic studies was first introduced historically. <clears throat> Traditionally, Islamic studies focused on what could be discovered from texts, which meant subject areas like philosophy, law, and other forms of religious thought, literature, history, and to a small extent, very small extent, the history of science as well as arts, crafts, and architecture. In addition, the subject was constricted by the limits of access. Not many people in Western academia could read the manuscripts, access to which was often limited in any case, and not very many manuscripts had been edited and very few translated. When I was doing my PhD at the American University in Beirut in the 70s on medieval Arab history, um, the Lebanese war ended up stopping me going to see manuscripts in Cairo and Baghdad and Damascus. But if I'd had access to the manuscripts that have been published since, my thesis would have been radically different. The amount of material that's been published from manuscripts in the decades since in the mid 1970s is astounding. Edward Said's critique of Orientalism at the end of the 1970s quickly became the iconic attack, attack on traditional approaches, although he wasn't the first to do it. His at times well-targeted and other times rather more diffuse criticism of Orientalism was not alone in motivating the changes we've seen in the last several decade, de decades. Other possibly more significant drivers of change include the growth of the direct involvement some skeptics might be tempted to say infiltration of diplomatic and funding interests from the Muslim world, especially by oil producing states since the 1970s. A continuing movement against Eurocentrism in the humanities and social sciences. Developments in university teaching approaches towards a more participatory direction since the student protests of, 1960s, of the late 1960s. Perhaps more significantly in our field, the settlement of a large Muslim communities in Europe, mostly in the West, but increasingly not only in the West, and the appearance of their children in our lecture halls. And finally, the sharp growth in security concerns since the late 1990s. The United Kingdom has one of the oldest European university tradition of Islamic studies, with the establishment of chairs in Arabic at Cambridge and Oxford universities in 1632 and 1636, respectively. The 19th century saw a major expansion of interest in that broad field, driven by the needs of running an empire with major Muslim subject populations and a related growth in plain curiosity. Don't underrate curiosity. From the early 20th century, as university policy became increasingly centrally managed, a number of working groups and commissions considered the role and nature of Islamic studies. And gradually, <clears throat> follow on from these, from this series of reports, the subject became more, shall we say, reality oriented. In 1944, the War Office and the Foreign Office founded the Middle East Center for Arabic Studies, MECAS, specifically to meet the needs for Arabic speakers. And several other universities were also teaching Arabic and other Middle Eastern languages, especially Persian and Turkish, as well as Middle East area studies, most notably Durham, Manchester, Edinburgh, 
where Arabic had been taught since the late 18th century. In 1961, the Hayter Report confirmed an area studies approach recommending the establishment of six to eight area study centers to meet the broader needs of society. By this time, as we come through the second half of the, 19th, of the 20th century, increasingly the graduates of Arabic, Middle East and Islamic studies at British universities are taken up by the Foreign Office, certainly, but increasingly also by industry. Um, and of course, from before the Second World War, especially by the, the oil industry, BP and others. But then increasing security concerns start in the late 1990s, made critical by the attacks on New York in September 2001, Madrid in March 2004, and London in July 2005. Now, 9-11 is often taken as the turning point. I would strongly suggest that the turning point had started already several years before. Um, basically, the shift of emphasis onto Islam, the new enemy. You remember that language? That started already after the collapse of the Cold War. The American, especially the American defense industry, uh, were dead scared of governments cashing in on the peace dividend, as they called it. So they encouraged the ideas of, it sounds like conspiracy theory, doesn't it? Um, the American defense industry encouraged the ideas of Islam, the new enemy, to make sure that defense departments continued to purchase. Um, Huntington's clash of civilizations was essentially a part of that process. In 2005-06, by then, there were 281 graduate students in Islamic studies. And this is by a narrow definition that doesn't include area studies in Britain. And 188 undergraduates spread over more than a dozen universities. In April 2007, a report on teaching about Islam at universities in England was published. It had been requested by the Minister for Higher Education and written by Dr. Taula Siddiqui of the Islamic Foundation near Leicester. He pointed out the disagreements about what constitutes Islamic studies and whether it could even be called a discipline. One of his significant interests was the growing community-based sector of university-level teaching. While a number of independent and pri privately financed Muslim colleges had come into existence, Siddiqui listed 25, although that may be an underestimate, very few of them had acquired some form of university accreditation. A later report from the Higher Education Funding Council for England listed four such, i.e. Islamic colleges that had got university accreditation. The report took note of some of the cooperation between universities and local Islamic institutions and the community, as well as of the interest of local young Muslims to study Islam at a university. Although there was a common desire that the theological aspects of Islam be taught by Muslim scholars. Now, this is an ongoing argument within the field. It goes on today. The very small numbers of Islamic institutions which had established links with the university, only four or five, illustrated a central challenge in this context to both the public and the Islamic sector. Many universities have been reluctant to extend their academic validation to the programs taught at such colleges, even though many more including a number of the older universities, have a long tradition of validating the teaching programs of the, of the numerous and varied church-related seminars, seminaries. This reflects in part a lack of confidence in the college's ability or preparedness to deliver the degree of critical ana analysis that they identify with university education. In some cases, it probably also reflects a lack of confidence in their own ability to monitor and assess satisfactorily the teaching that goes on in these colleges. Portsmouth, Loughborough universities, Portsmouth in particular for a time in the 80s and early 90s, was accrediting Islamic seminaries, um, half a dozen, including the Islamic Foundation at one time. Um, Loughborough also for a period, Gloucester for a period. Um, but Portsmouth in particular pulled out because they didn't have in-house expertise to with, with the qualifications to engage in the 
quality control that such a accreditation required. But it also reflects a wish on the part of many of the Islamic institutions to remain independent of public university scrutiny. After all, their religious legit legitimacy and authority rests overwhelmingly on their standing in Muslim communities, which they see themselves as serving. And if they want an enhanced Islamic standing in such environment, they're more likely to get it through an association with Islamic institutions such as Azhar in Cairo, or in the case of many of them, from their being part of the Deobandi Dar al system. This reluctance to cooperate from both sides also reflects the widespread assumption that only Muslim scholars can legitimately teach Islam. Siddiqui did briefly touch on the training of Islamic scholars, a matter which in the general debate over recent years has tended to be focused on Islam imam training. Now, through the 90s, I remember we were frequently asked, or there were Muslim organizations in this country and in other European countries, frequently asking for state support for imam training. They argued that you know the state supports theological training, the training of clergy for the churches, so why shouldn't it train, uh, support the training of imams in the Muslim community? Usually, not always, but usually that assertion rested on a misunderstanding of the nature of the state's involvement in teaching of theology. But there was always, even when theoretically and legally, the teaching of theology was academic and not confessional, there was always a gray area um, which made it difficult to defend the public refusal. The other aspect of this call for imam training, when they were doing it in the 90s, the government's, plural here, the government's in response was always just to reject it out of hand. Not interested, not our business, you sort it. Then came 9-11. And suddenly governments left, right and center were calling for the production of homegrown imams. Um, some governments then did actually go ahead and try and set up something. Public funding for the training of Islamic scholars in Europe had until this point been focused on the training of school teachers of Islamic religious education, primarily in Belgium and Austria. Now, here again, you have to keep in mind the enormous variations uh, in religious education, how it's conducted in a variety of European countries. Um, in some European countries, and Belgium and Austria and Germany uh, are the most obvious examples, religious education is confessional. So the Catholic children are sent to Catholic religious education, Protestant children are sent to Protestant religious education, and where there's enough, Jewish children are sent to Jewish religious education. Um, <clears throat> and the training of those teachers is conducted in state institutions. The salaries are funded by the state. The syllabuses are negotiated between the ministries of education and the church community to whom the children and the syllabus belong. Now, Belgium and Austria, in some ways, were in advance here. Uh, Islam had joined the small list of formally recognized religious communities in 1974 in Belgium and 1979 in, in Austria. In both countries, the recognition entailed the right to publicly funded provision of Islamic religious instruction for Muslim children and of the training for the necessary teachers. For complicated political reasons, the development of this in Belgium went, took much, much longer time. It was really only at the beginning of the 21st century that Belgian provision was beginning to be anything like satisfactory. The Austrians were in there um, quickly and well organized. Had to do with, um, had more actually to do with internal politics of the Muslim communities than it did with anything else. And in Belgium, of course. Um, the moment that when you got to the point where you thought you got something organized, the Belgian constitution changed and the federal structures met, messed up and down on things and you suddenly had to start negotiating all over again with another layer of federal structure. The foundations of similar experience had been laid in Germany during the 1980s, 
although in a decentralized and more tentative way, given the location, the location of education at the level of the lender, the member states of the federation, not the federal level, and the long-standing reluctance of the German authorities to recognize the permanence of the immigrant and ethnic minority, minority communities. The Faculty of Education at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg was one of the pioneers in attempting to construct an Islamic religious instruction program drawn on the experience of the training of teachers of Protestant RI, a religious instruction. Typically, of course, in German fashion, um, the German law is very strict about the terms on which Religionsunterricht, religious education, can be conducted. So the Erlang Nuremberg program, developed in conjunction with the federal state of North Rhine Westphalia, avoided that trap by calling itself religiöse Unterweisung, not Religionsunterricht. Because the law says Religionsunterricht, so if you call it something else, um, it's something different. How do you translate religiöse Unterweisung? Religious education. Um, but then came this development about 12 years ago. Politically, it's remarkable for, presenting the, for representing the culmination of a major shift in the attitude of the German state towards Muslim communities. For many years, the attitude to the authorities was that Muslim access to religious instruction within the public school system depended on the Muslim community achieving recognized status on a par with the existing religious community as a public law body, Körperschaftes öffentlichen Rechts. Such recognition, as well as education, falls within the powers of the member states, not the federal level. At the beginning of the 1980s, some of these states recognized that this situation was increasingly untenable. And this was one when North Rhine-Westphalia went into cooperation with uh, Erlangen-Nürnberg and started their experimental um, syllabus development. Various states began to look more creatively at possibilities, including an initiative at the University of Münster, which established the first chair in Islamic theology in 2004 with a view to training teachers in the subject. And this teacher business is actually quite important because whatever kind of education program you set up at the higher education level, who's going to buy the produce, to put it crudely? Where are the graduates going to find work? In Germany, the field of Islamic studies had been affected by the same factors seen elsewhere in Europe and the US. The intellectual self-criticism symbolized in the debate about Orientalism, the public resurgence of Islam in the Muslim world, the growth and integration of new domestic Muslim communities, and the development of their institutions, and the focus on radicalization and security in the new century. When the discussion turned to Islamic theology as distinct from the traditional academic study of Islam in the Muslim world, the initial framework of thinking was in terms of parallels to the status and role of the existing recognized mainstream churches, Protestant and Catholic, and other religious communities, primarily Jewish, but in some states also Methodist. Their status were recognized in public law within the competence of the member states of the Federation. And related to this status was the right to confessional religious education for children provided by trained teachers following syllabi approved jointly by the relevant church and by the state authorities. The clergy likewise were trained in the Catholic or Protestant faculties of several universities by lecturers or professors who enjoyed the approval of their church authorities as well as the academic authorization system of the universities. What could be more simple than to apply this due course in due course to Islam? After the end of the Cold War, the religious and political environment changed with the reunification with the former German Democratic Republic and its doctrinally secular, secular tradition. In the, German, in the East German federal states, there was no tradition of recognition of religious communities at all. And the gradual realization that the parallel between Islam and the churches was not simple, not to mention the growing number of German citizens who were actually leaving the churches. 
The German Council of Science and Humanities, the Wissenschaftsrat, responded to this complex dynamism by setting up a commission to look at the whole field of theology and religious studies in higher education. Their 2010 report registered the growing dis distance between the traditional philology-based aspects of Islamic studies, religious sciences with their increasingly social science-based approach, and the more confessional expectations of Islamic theology as Muslim communities start to make their presence felt. Following the publication of the report, the then Federal Minister of Education, Annette Chavan, who was actually a Catholic theologian by training, announced that her ministry would invite applications from universities in the most affected states to apply for seed funding for chairs and centers departments in Islamic theology, as distinct from Islamic studies, which remained in the humanities faculties. <coughs> So they had they, they made a very clear distinction between Islam is a student applied to the new subject and Islam Wissenschaften applied to the traditional Islamic Middle East studies tradition. The word theology was avoided as this was judged to be too Christian in character. And English and in English, the term Islamic sciences is more likely to be understood as the traditional core disciplines of confessional Islamic studies as taught at Islamic faculties in the Muslim world. In the end, the whole process of selection completely lacked transparency. The funding was awarded to the universities of Erlangen Nuremberg, Frankfurt with Gießen, Münster, Tübingen, and Osnabrück. Today, all the chairs have been filled in some, place, some cases with three chairs, some cases two chairs. I don't think there's anybody with four. Covers 13 chairs in all. It's clear that there's a shortage of well-qualified candidates who can function in German. So some of the posts may well have been filled with less qualified candidates at a lower level or on a temporary basis. It's not for me to tell you who these lesser qualified candidates might be. It's an experiment that demands close attention. And sorry, that doesn't mean that all the people in those positions are lesser qualified. Some of them are brilliant. Um, it's an experiment that demands close attention, not only within Germany, and one that will certainly be given close attention by others in the broader field of Islamic studies, not to mention Islamic faculties around the Muslim world, but especially in Turkey, because that's where the majority of German Muslims come from. Um, today, there are possibly somewhere around 2,000 students in these five faculties. And they are mostly going in the direction of becoming teachers of Islamic, of Islamic confessional education in state schools. What they are not becoming and this is the problem with some of the projects that have been set up in the Netherlands has done something. Um, there's been attempts in Belgium, but those two, those two countries in particular, um, they have tried to develop an imam training. But where are these people going to get jobs is the basic question. The Turkish mosques won't take them because the Turkish mosques get their imams sent from, from Ankara, from the Diyanet. The Moroccan mosques will only accept Moroccans who come out of the traditional Moroccan training. So the graduates of these uh, programs in the Netherlands, which, is the mo which was the most developed system, have found jobs as um, what we in English would call chaplains in the army, in prisons and in hospitals. But that's a limited market. There comes a point when all the available posts are full. And um, of the three programs that were set up 15 years ago, only one survives. The various European developments sketched above raise a number of questions of an institutional political nature, as well as regarding the concept of Islamic studies as a university taught subject. One way of approaching this can be in terms of stakeholders namely those people and institutions which in one way or another have an interest in the development and provision 
of Islamic studies in the broadest sense. One, funding. Since the 19th century, the growing involvement of state funding in universities has been a major driver of how the subject has developed. First, it was a small esoteric niche, niche subject, in many ways somewhat like a medieval guild, with, with a few senior professors often acting as restrictive gamekeepers in which the theolo theology and the churches had the main interest, even if some of the scholars involved weren't necessarily sympathetic to the church. Um, I had a German colleague some four decades ago who started studying Arabic at Frankfurt University. For those of you who have studied Arabic, you'll be familiar with Wright's grammar. No, sorry, yeah. The German equivalent is, um, oh, what's his name? No? Huh? No. Uh, starts with G. No, it's not. The, the, the editor of Geschichte der Arab, des Arab, der Arab, des Arabischen Literaturs. Brockelmann's grammar, exactly. She learned Arabic from Brockelmann's grammar. And after a year of study, she knew everything there was to know about the noun, but couldn't put a simple sentence together. Now, that was typical of the traditional way of teaching Arabic. It was like a guild. The entry was made as difficult as possible. I was lucky to be of the first generation at SOAS, where Arabic was actually taught like a language to be used. Um, from the late 18th and with increasing strength through the 19th century, the needs of empire became dominant while remaining in competition with the Enlightenment emphasis on a search for factual knowledge. This led to an expansion of the subject area in the direction of social sciences, especially ethnology and anthropology, and of more regionally focused work. Britain and South Asia, where, inter where interests also included the other South Asian religious cultures, the Netherlands in the East Indies, and France in North Africa. By the middle of the 20th century, it was increasingly difficult to speak of Islamic studies without also making more than passing reference to the variety of disciplines which were being included in the movement towards area studies. It made more sense to talk of the study of Islam, Muslims, and the Muslim world. However, language-based focuses, Arabic, Turkish, Persian, and Urdu especially, continued to be offered with varying fortunes, and especially Middle Eastern studies acquired a life of its own um, with varying fortunes. And increasingly, it's clear that it was, the gov it was government's perception of what was important which determined primarily through the funding instrument, where the focus of the general area of teaching should be placed and where the parts of the subject or the subject as a whole should, be, should advance or, ret or, or retrench. And retrenchment, more often than advance, was usual. It was in Britain that relevant university departments first almost systematically sought independent funding from the Muslim world to ensure the survival of their interests. This practice originated mainly with chairs and research activities, which tended to be more attractive to potential funders, but additional academic staff also meant that undergraduate activities could be maintained. This way forward only became a serious option after the jump in oil prices of 1972 to 74 filled the treasuries of a number of Muslim states and their leading businesses. Iraqi funding ensured the continuation of the chair in Islamic studies at Edinburgh University when Professor William Montgomery Watt retired in 1979. There was a period for two years where, you, where, the, where the chair couldn't be filled because people didn't want to be associated with an Iraqi funded chair. It was popularly in the circles called the bath chair. Subsequently, other universities found substantial funding sources in Saudi Arabia, Brunei, Sharjah, Kuwait and Turkey, among others, in some cases from governments, in others from wealthy private individuals. There's been much less such funding activity in mainland Europe. The funding for the, from the Sultanate of Oman for a chair in the study of Islam in the West at Leiden is unusual. There have been recurring questions about the degree of influence that funders expect over the activities of the recipients. Influence is very difficult to prove, although one, one, is, one often 
is entitled to assume that at least there is a coincidence of interests when a university department approaches a specific funder for support. Only occasionally does the initiative come from the funder. In the early 1980s, there was a common view that a lecturer at one British university, which will be nameless, was released, sacked, because his interest in marginal esoteric forms of Islam did not please the donor. The donor came to visit the university and the vice chancellor was so proud of his Islamic studies lecturer's work that he talked to the donor about all the various things he had published. <laughs> it was all heretical, her heretical, heterodox stuff. And the donor said, forget it, no more money. So that's the second. Often the question of funders' influence on teaching and research policy has been discussed in a partial fashion. The focus has, has been on the alleged impact of a foreign funder in the field, usually from one of the wealthy oil states that tended to be identified with conservative forms of Islam. In my view, the British experience does not permit any clear cut conclusions, but it's commonly the case that complaints about the dangers of influence of conservative Islam via such funding are blind to the profound influence of domestic national governments on teaching and research activities. <coughs> So it's okay to complain about Saudi or Kuwaiti funding for a, uni for a university department. That is partial and influences. The fact that you're receiving money from your own government is of course completely objective and neutral. Don't believe that for a minute. The focus on research relating to security, radicalization of young Muslims and related fields over the last 15 years should be a sufficient reminder, especially if one were to take into consideration the enormous expansion of such academic activity in the US during this period. The number of Arabic language, Arabic and Turkish language posts that were opened up in the US after 9-11 after is unbelievable. And many of them were funded by the Pentagon, which of course is completely neutral and objective. Then there's students as users. In the first instance, the users, the consumers of Islamic studies are the students, both undergraduate and graduate. Before the middle of the 20th century, not only were there few students in the field, but those who did exist had little to say about the content and approach of the courses they followed. The professors had almost dictatorial powers in the determination of course content, and often on the graduate student's choice of research topics. My supervisor, when, when I start, came to a PhD, I had the freedom, freedom, I may have been lucky, I had the freedom to decide what I wanted to research. But the, what I heard, heard from my supervisor's generation was that they had been told by their supervisors what to research. <clears throat> Two parallel developments have taken place in the last half century to change that. On the one hand, there was an expectation which arose out of the student revolts of the late 60s that students should have a say in what was taught, a demand which often brought with it the demand for relevance. On the other hand was the gradual shift of higher education from being confined to an academic elite to becoming a forum for mass education. From a situation where less than 5% of secondary school graduates entered higher education in the 60s, it's my generation, Today, in some European countries, we're approaching 50%. With the distribution of public, public funding being increasingly tied to the distribution and movement of students, universities have had to learn how to function in a quasi-market environment where supply cannot afford to distance itself too far from the patterns of demand. Since the 1990s, the degree to which British universities have seen overseas student tuition fees as a significant source of income has also had an impact on decisions as to which specialism to prioritize when filling academic posts. Uh, a lecturer can basically pay for his or her own salary these days if he or she can find eight full-time overseas students. With eight full-time overseas students, 13,000 pounds a head, overheads going to the Central University Fund, you've still paid your own salary. And then there's the communities. 
in some specific environments, it's one way or another the Muslim community that's the stakeholder rather than the individual student. This is the case in countries where Islamic religious instruction is a publicly funded provision for Muslim children, usually because such a provision is all already available for the main Christian communities. The German out case outlined above is a good example, as is the Austrian one. There's in such instances the possibility of tensions between the academic criteria of the university that is hosting the teacher training and the expectations of the community sponsoring the program, where the latter is likely to have an influence both on appointments and on course contents. <clears throat> an example of such tensions came to a head, coming to a head was withdrawal of church teaching authorization from the Roman Catholic theologian Hans Küng at the University of Tübingen in 1979, following his attack on the doctrine of papal infallibility. Church authority was withdrawn, but the university couldn't sack him because he was appointed on university terms. So he was moved out of the Faculty of Theology into the Faculty of Humanities with a different contract, but he stayed on, on, on staff. More recently, in 2008-9, Dr. Mohammed Sven Kalish, teaching Islamic theology at the University of Munster, in the first training program in the country for Islamic RE teachers, found himself in a similar situation when he announced that his research had led him to conclude that the Prophet Muhammad had never existed. The university had to keep him on the academic staff under its own regulations while the sponsoring Muslim committee uh, withdrew its cooperation from the university obliging it to move him out of the Islamic teacher training program to which the university then appointed a new person to teach. Apparently his successor has got into similar kinds of problems. Um, this experience will have covered the appointment processes in the five universities mentioned. Um, equally interesting <clears throat> will be the expansion of this system to the training of teachers of the Alevi religion. Is Alevism a separate religion or is a subgroup heterodox of Islam, of Islamic Shiism? <laughs> Ask different Alevi, Ale, uh, Alevis, you get different answers. We're not talking about Syrian Alevis, we're not talking about Moroccan Alevis, we're talking about Turkish Alevis, which is a different animal altogether. Interesting because, especially in, in Austria, because in December 2010, the Austrian Constitutional Court decided the government had to accept an Alevi application for recognition separately from the grant from the one traditionally granted to Sunnis of the Hanafite rite. This is likely, and we get some interesting situation here, is likely to require not only that Alevi religious instruction, including teacher training, be made available, but also that Alevis will need to develop a degree of consensus on what Alevism actually is in terms of theology and ritual potentially a cause for internal rifts in the future with consequences for relations with schools and the university teacher training department, let alone the state department of education. In this changing environment, the teaching of Islam has been challenged by the increase of Muslim students in first degree programs. A, sub a substantial proportion of these students have not chosen to study the subject with a view to relevant employment, but rather as part of their personal search for forms of Islamic faith and practice that make sense to them in their European urban environment in a way that Islam of their parents and mosque imams fails to do. When I did Arabic here at SOAS in 1966, we were three students in the year. There are now 60, the vast majority of them Bangladeshis, mostly women from the East End of London who have chosen to study Arabic. They don't have a career expectation out of this. They're not certainly going to work for multinationals working in the Gulf or something. It's for their own personal skill development, religious skill development. On the face of it, most European university theology departments have long since adopted the critical scientific principles of learning, whereby particularly historical critical methods reign supreme. So it's possible for certain Christian theologians to present historical analyses that completely contradict their traditional beliefs. Of course, in recent years, we've seen, especially in the US, a reaction against this academic tradition. In universities, and especially in certainly in seminars, seminaries, dogma has again begun to set the limit for academic research. In most Islamic faculties in the Muslim world, essential dogmas still set the limits. 
Not only is it difficult, if not impossible, to challenge received core truth, but it's often difficult to challenge teaching which were re teachings which were reached in the third, fourth centuries of Islam. It's certainly impossible to follow through on research that appears to lead to a serious revision in the understanding of the prophet and the interpretation of the Quranic text, as a number of scholars have discovered to their cost. But it's also difficult in many places to defend use, views that might be labeled, for example, Mu'tazilite. In a European university, which is usually governed by rules of religious neutrality, if not explicitly secular, if a student's research leads to the conclusion that, Muhammad, that the Prophet Muhammad never existed, then so be it. This is an extreme case and very like, unlikely, but in my own experience, I've regularly been faced with a problem relating to, for example, the study of Hadith. Some of my academic colleagues would insist, would insist that no study of a topic based on Hadith, for example, Usul al-Fiqh, can be legitimate without engaging in the question of their authenticity. I would argue that the fact of the Hadith and certainly those conventionally accepted as Sahih are regarded by the vast majority of Muslims and uh, are regarded the vast, vast majority of Muslims as authentic must be the starting point for a study that might be looking, for example, at developments of the contemporary Islamic law of taught. Some of our the academic colleagues would agree, but others would not. This isn't just a theoretical discussion because a university system like the British one insists on the supremacy of the external examiner and the external examiner might very well be someone who disagrees with our starting point. In the end, it's the student who suffers any consequences of such examiner bias. So as a supervisor, I'm very careful who I select as external examiner. Now this brings me to a related and to my mind, and I'm almost finished, equally important issue. Muslim students often come from academic traditions very different from those of Britain and many other European countries. This is obviously the case where there's an emphasis on rote learning, as is the case in some cultures, and where the teacher is regarded as an authority who should not be challenged. Moreover, the divisions go deeper. The debate on Orientalism was interesting while it lasted, and it has had some effect in terms of political stances of institutions and individuals but nothing of great significance to my mind. It was an interesting discussion, but it hasn't really revolutionized on its own. It hasn't revolutionized um, our approaches. We still have an institutionalized consensus, consensus which says that the way Western universities teach and conduct research is the right and the best one in terms of both teaching methods and objectives. But we're working with students and institutions who have other ideas. Do we simply ignore them and assume that they have to meet our requirements? Or do we take advantage of the situation and explore the interaction and perhaps the possibility of creative interaction between different traditions of learning that this situation offers us? And how might we do this without being accused of being seduced by the flexible vagueness of postmodernism or worst of all, lowering standards? Given such considerations, is not surprising that many Muslim organizations prefer to develop their own religious and teaching institutions. They exist in a more or less formal ways and are more or less well funded in many European countries and especially large numbers, several dozen in Britain. Some have sought or are sought seeking formal recognition either as in the Netherlands directly by the relevant government body or as in Britain indirectly through accreditation by a public university. This process, still at a very early stage, could point in the direction of the solution at which many churches have arrived. Church seminaries, Protestant and Catholic, have existed for decades and centuries to train their clergy. At a time when universities were still overwhelmingly of religious foundation, this was not a problem. But as universities became secular institutions, various models were devised to ensure that space could be preserved for confessional theological training and research. In some cases, as in Germany, this meant a reserved space within the universities. In other cases, the relationship was more distanced. And there were always small attendances, either within the major churches or smaller independent churches, which insisted on remaining completely independent of the public higher education sector. Muslim organizations in Europe are beginning to experiment in a similar direction, characterized by an acceptance of the distinctiveness of seminary 
from the secular university, which in some cases may mean a complete rejection of cooperation, and in others, more frequently, a degree of mutuality. Thank you. Now, so I'm quite interested in the German situation with the distinction between, let's use the phrase, professional theological training and academic research in Islam. And to what extent? have there been serious tensions between the two? Because in confessional theological training, I can understand that any <coughs> research which seeks to sort of establish that the Prophet Muhammad never, never lived is sort of out of scope. It, it just makes no sense whatsoever. But conversely, I see it as absolutely right at the heart of the academic study of Islam mm -hmm. as a subject in the communities. <laughs> So, to what extent has Germany experienced this tension and developed really clear ground rules about the distinction between the two? It was quite explicit in the discussions that led up to the um, federal government's funding of this project. The traditional academic departments of Islamwissenschaften, the Islamic Sciences German, um, would have nothing to do with this. Um, and that's the reason why Islamic theology has been set up in separate faculties. Effectively, you have a small Islamic theology faculty parallel with the humanities or Orientalism, Orientalism faculty in parallel with the Protestant Catholic theological faculties. Uh, one, one would not have anything to do with the other in the setting up period. But as things have developed, I know of some of the, certainly one or two of these Islamic theology professors who come out of the German-speaking German scientific tradition, who are now teaching in the theology faculties, and who are effectively bridging the initial gap between the two sectors and some places i mean in in these universities there's some faculty that in some universities in which one faculty will have nothing to do with the other there are other universities in which some of the staff members in one will operate with some of the staff members in the other there are some of them in which the islamic theology staff will cooperate with with the catholic theology staff so once the, once the structure is set up it all depends very much on the attitudes and interests of the individual professors and their assistants, which is when it begins to become creative. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, lecture. I, mean, I don't know uh, the chair would allow me how many questions, but I think I have. Oh, he's very strict. I know, I know. I see he looks at it. Uh, well, I, I might start with your your answer to Jonas' very first, very first question about uh, uh, students and, and, and the field or discipline of Islamic studies. And from your experience, um, why we have this uh, problem or dichotomy? Uh, is it because the students uh, were not exposed to critical thinking sort of school uh, in their early education or it's the teachers problems um, not finding a leeway to crack this uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about myself as a teacher so I'm sorry but we have we have to we have to face the truth and, and the second quickly question is about because this is another concern you mentioned about uh, AUB in the 60s and not allowing you to to get manuscripts I think it's still the, the case in the, in the Middle East, I mean, you, you don't have access to most of the written heritage manuscripts. Like Can I do that one backwards? Yeah. Uh, access to manuscripts has always been a problem, <clears throat> partly because they're, they're very fragile and have to be preserved, but very often these traditional um, Arab Islamic foundation libraries 
the librarian is very possessive doesn't like allowing people in here <laughs> try to get access to some of the some of these uh, Islamic manuscript libraries in Aleppo or Damascus or Cairo or, or Baghdad can sometimes be impossible. It's not just the Islamic ones. Trying to get access to the manuscript libraries of the, some of the Coptic semin seminaries is equally difficult. Um, and it's the the librarians who are a combination of careful, but also extraordinarily possessive. Having hold of that key gives them power. And there's not much other power they have, to be quite honest. Um, Having fended that one off, what was your first question? Yeah, I was talking about the students who come from the... Yes. Um, it's enormously different which university they come from, um, which country they come from. I have found, for example, the Saudi students I've had, in a sense, have been self-selecting. It's only the critical ones who who decide they want to do a PhD at a Western university. Um, so I've been reasonably happy with the Saudi PhD students I've, I've had. I've had one or two who have come to this country and then decided they want to do a PhD. And well, my experience of students, the graduates of the University of Medina is that they know the hadith back to front, but they don't know what to do with them. And comparing notes on that subject with Sharia faculty staff at the uh, university in um, Jeddah, they share the same example, they share the same experience of Medina graduates. So it, 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 even within one country, it varies enormously. We had Students who have come out of Jordan, for example, from the Sharia faculty, who come out with a very sound training, but who are curious, who are inquisitive and want to explore. And they've gone back and opened up an MA program taught in English to get away from, from the control of the older generation and more conservative staff in the, in the faculty. I shouldn't be saying this. Um, it depends very much on where people come from in their personal, academic, mental, spiritual, national, cultural biography. Um, on the whole, I've found Malaysian students to be more prepared to be open, but I wouldn't generalize. There's always the exception. I would say, I don't know what your experience of supervising PhD students is, um, but my experience is that out of every five, four are bread and butter. The fifth is really exciting. And I can't predict when they first start, I can't predict which one is going to be that fifth. Just from where they come from, which department they come from. I'm more likely to expect the fifth to be a woman from experience. You can ask me why or someone else can ask me why. Professor, thank you very much for your lecture. I'll uh, come back to the why that after this one. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating lecture. Can you shed some light on the future of Muslims in Europe in the light of the far right organizations in Denmark Britain, Austria, Belgium, every country in Europe is Islamophobic. And we Muslims are very much worried about, are we going to confront with the same, same fate as the Bosnian Muslims uh, earlier uh, this century, end of the century? Or uh, what, what are the future, future of Islam in Europe? Can I? Just twist one sentence you said there. Europe is Islamophobic. 
Yes. I would correct that and say there is Islamophobia in Europe. Yes. Not all of Europe is Islamophobic. No. Not, not all Europe, not all Europeans are Islamic. Exactly. There are five, and I mean, five that is, parties, that is key. We have in this country and Austria. Yeah. Um, we are worried about our future in Europe. Of course you are. Um, but that's not a new worry. In the early 90s, I remember my British Muslim students presenting the idea precisely that the war against the Bosnians after the breakup of Yugoslavia was the first stage in an attempt to rid Europe of Muslims. Now, that was a generation ago. Yes. And it hasn't happened. And it's very interesting. It doesn't say it can't happen. But it's very interesting that um, if you... There are a number of opinion surveys among Muslims in Europe of the older generation, the younger generation, educated, non-educated, where the vast majority, and I mean the vast, it's plus 70% plus, sometimes 80% plus, state that they feel at home in wherever they are. Young British Muslims in one survey that have uh, people that have been born and grown up here, answer that 80% they feel Muslim. But 80% also say they feel British. Even in France. You can be British and Muslim, can't you? Well, precisely, but very often the question is put, isn't it? Um, are you British or Muslim? No, you can be both. Well, you and I have no problem with arguing that, but very often in the press, in the media and among politicians, the question is put in those terms. Are you British or Muslim? Exactly. Or if they want to be a little bit more inclusive, they will say, are you British first or Muslim first? This is Islamophobic, actually. This question yeah. is Islamophobic. It, it, the, the question is wrong. And all the evidence suggests that the vast majority of Muslims, especially the younger generation, but also the older, are quite happy to say that they are British. Well, they're actually, the ones in Birmingham are even more Birmingham than they're British. The lo local, and that's not just Birmingham, local patriotism is very often stronger than national patriotism, wherever you are. Um, again, the right wing nationalist movements that we're seeing at the moment, mm -hmm. I, would, uh, I would suggest are a phase. We are not in a development which is going from here to here or like this. We're in a development which is going up and down. Um, we've seen signs around Europe. Salvini's party was thrown out of government in Italy. In Denmark, the Danish People's Party lost over half of its parliamentary seats at the last election in the early summer. Um, and so these things go up and down and in and out. All research in Den Denmark, for example, indicates that while the previous government, especially its Minister of Integration, was pretty bad news for anybody who was not Danish Danish. Um, that while she and some of the right wing media were playing this particular Islamophobic anti immigrant tune at the national level, what was going on at the local level in the operational parts of government, whether it be local government or the police, for example, or the health service were being much more constructive and inclusive than that national melody would seem to indicate. So I think you have to, you, you have to be very careful about generalizing. Don't get too pessimistic. No, I'm not actually. I remember, oh, good. Donald, I remember Ronald Reagan. He said after the Afghanistan war, when Russia pulled out, that Reagan said, and it's, I've got a video on it, that Mujahideen saved Islam. He said, in 1985, Maggie Thatcher went to Islamabad in Pakistan. I was there then. And she said the same thing, that the Mujahideen saved Islam. So how do they fluctuate their opinion? Uh, Always. It's short-term political, short political media opportunism. And the corruption in media in the Western countries. It's short-term short political that opportunism. Is why the, yeah. the Islamophobic uh, the feelings are in Europe. Can I respond to that one yeah. earlier? 
Yes, please. <laughs> Quick fire off again. What did you say? Why women? Why? I was curious. Yeah. Why, why, why women? <clears throat> well, first of all, you've got a situation generally in higher education across the world, including the Arab Muslim world, where an increasing number of women are going to university. Increasing number of women are being educationally successful. I happen to be sitting in a faculty dean's office, front office waiting to see him in the University of the Emirates in um, the line. And the secretary gave me the last annual report to read. Fascinating stuff, really entertaining. Uh, but actually it was a very interesting piece of reading because it gave the statistics for the previous year's graduating class. In every single faculty, including maths, natural sciences, engineering, and agriculture, there were more women students than men. In every single faculty, including, of course, Islamic studies, in every single faculty, the average grade of women was five to 10 points higher than of men. Now, part of it clearly is the women come through with much stronger motivation. And it's a patriarchal society. So that the women who are not doing well in secondary school get pulled out of school and sent into marriage often. But the women who are successful get pushed on. So the women who get into higher education are likely to be more, more highly motivated, more successful, more interested. <laughs> It's 30 years since the, since the Faculty of Engineering in Damascus. Engineering had more women students than men. And it's been developing since then. And in the European situation especially, the women who are following Islamic studies or generally going into some form of post-secondary education have a strong motivation to do good and to think for themselves because their self-interest lies in improving their social situation. Men can sit back. The social situation advantage is given to them. Women have to fight for theirs and do, and it shows. I mean, my expectation is, to be quite honest, that within the Western minority situation, it is primarily women researchers and students who are going to lead the production of, we call it the, the, new, the production of new knowledge, the, call it the reformation of Islam, it's a term I hate, but you know what I mean. I click on the wrong list now, it's turning the question raised by respected gentlemen. Uh, the um, responsibility of Islamophobia lies on both sides, I think. It's in the Muslims and on the West side. Um, which aspect do you think is most is the most important to study on to narrow this gap of Islamophobia? Whether we should uh, uh, rectify the understanding of West, uh, it lies in the Muslims, which needs to be rectified. For, unfortunately, I regret to say, I don't think evidence indicates that studying Islam at university in one form or another by non-Muslims is not helping. Perhaps if they're following a program of Islamic studies, yes, but if they're following a program of history, political science, theology and religion generally, law, and they choose to do an optional module or two on an aspect or, or other of Islam, the evidence is that they come out of that module with a more negative view of Islam than they had before they went in. So I don't think higher education in Islamic studies in the form that it takes at the moment, is going to help this issue. What I, what I think is helping, not only will, but is helping, 
is the growing acquaintance of ordinary people at a daily level as neighbors in employment, uh, in the shops and so on. That's all the evidence is that that is making a difference. You know, the first step is when someone says to you, I don't mind that you're a Muslim. You're not like the others. That's always the first step. You're not like the others. You're all right. But as that develops, um, is, it, it very quickly becomes not just the one, but it comes many, and of course, vice versa. Uh, did anybody see this fascinating program in the spring, I think it was, on the BBC? Um, two Birmingham schools, secondary schools, um, one with an overwhelmingly white population, another one with an overwhelmingly a Tamworth, uh, and, and a Birmingham school, an overwhelmingly South Asian population, were spent a month or two exchanging classes. It was fascinating what happened when they got to know each other. There was one fantastic, there, there, <laughs> there was one storyline going through about this white kid from Tamworth, who fell in, well, basically fell in love with one of the Muslim women, girls, headscarf and everything, from, from Birmingham. Um, and she hesitated initially, but she got, she got more interested. Uh, I mean, it didn't develop anywhere. But these two totally different people, totally different social uh, backgrounds, suddenly got to know each other and suddenly the headscarf was not a barrier. Um, it was a fascinating program. More kind, more, more exchanges of that kind ought to take place, but it's taking place in the workplace, uh, all over the place in this country. In Denmark, you were about a generation behind, but that's not because we are slower in Denmark. It's because the immigration took place a generation later in Denmark than we did here. A little slower. Huh? A little slower. Oh, shut up! Just because <laughs> you're Swedish. <laughs> So we, we've got three more questions, and they are very disciplined. You're not as disciplined, so... No, I'm dreadful. Yeah, so, please. Yeah, so um, thanks for the lecture. Um, actually, I, I want to mention two quick points before I ask my question, because I, I studied in, I'm Egyptian, and I studied in Azak for 14 years. So uh, before I come here to do my master's at source, so... Sorry, did you study in Arabic, or did you do the English language Arabic, one? Yeah, in Arabic, okay. Arabic. And in Arabic, but in the faculty, I studied in English. Right. Uh, but um, yeah, the like um, regarding the library, the manuscripts. I mean, like yeah, in the past that was really hard, but like recently there are a lot of de developments and. The, well, they've all been can, published. Now. No, I mean yeah, I can you can very easily yeah. access anything yeah. and. You can't, of course, expect like the library, the Egyptian library, would be like the English one, but like <laughs> they'll probably be able able to uh, get an access in uh, Islamophobic. I mean, like, well, um, this is my own opinion. I do have like many learner friends here in my age, and uh, I think younger younger generations are. Uh, are able to understand the case very well. They're not at all Islamophobic. I think, like there are many uh, many practices from some of those who are called Muslims themselves, and they are the cause, the main cause behind this misunderstanding uh, on Islamic issues. So, yeah, I think we do play a major role in spreading this. Um, uh, this ideology as well, like, so I don't want us to be like, put in the corner and say, like, Islamophobic stuff. I think absolutely right, and to a degree, the shoe pinches on both sides. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, my question is, I studied law uh, at, in al Azhar, a positive law compared with Islamic Sharia or Islamic law. And unfortunately, when I was applying for to do my master's here, um, I found out because from the scratch, when you look at Islamic Sharia or Islamic law, you find two main perspectives. Creed, which represents about 9% of Islamic 
of, or of Sharia, and 91% is all about fuck, jurisprudence or principles of Islam, jurisprudence yeah. and stuff like this. And my main uh, interest falls within the other area, like Islamic jurisprudence, because it's solid law, so it's all about like dealings and, uh, and, and contracts and stuff like this. But unfortunately, I found this these courses are only in like two or three universities in the UK. Whereas when it comes to theology, the nine percent of is not sure yet creed. Mm -hmm. There are too many schools. Um, again, according to my understanding, I think like there is a crucial need to understand the basic Islamic like construction and give more uh, like importance to the other side, which constitutes like 91% of Islamic law. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm just asking like, because this is my opinion or, or this is my view, maybe correct me if I'm wrong or like if there is some kind of development in this area, I would like to <clears throat> I think we're still in a transitional phase. I think you're absolutely right. And it's sad that it's very few universities, I mean, Salas is one, uh, where you can get a, a course or program in Islamic law, fiqh or sul, or family law in Salas's case, or commercial law. Um, while I was in Copenhagen, I tried <clears throat> to persuade my colleagues in Islamic Middle East Studies in the Faculty of Humanities, I was in theology, that we should get together with the Faculty of Law to develop a program in this field. No interest. From the, the Faculty of Law was not interested. In Birmingham, no interest. Although they've got a lot of Muslim law students and some of them, not many, but sufficient numbers of them are going out into private legal practices where they're dealing with Islamic family law or matters to do with Islamic family law, but they've not got the training. <clears throat> it seems to me to be a missed opportunity, both in terms of training lawyers, but also in terms of that dialogue between law, Sharia and fiqh, and all the issues around being Muslim in a minority non-Muslim environment. Um, I mean, if there's a red thread in my academic career, it's actually Islamic law. It was my major when I did my MA in Middle East Area Studies. Um, and my PhD was on the administration of law in Mamluk Egypt. Bahari Mamluk. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your enlightening talk. Uh, yeah, just take more from what the gentleman said over there. Uh, and like you rightly expressed, whole of Europe and whole of Europe is not Islamophobic. You know, they're... Uh, Can I correct that? There's a lot of Islamophobia in Europe. It is not the whole of Europe that is Islamophobic. Yeah, that's what I mean. that's what I said. Yeah. There's not enough. There's quite a few. They're very... Uh, we have very good many intelligent people in Europe, thankfully, and I don't think this movement will go very strong. And my question to you is, how far can the academics, any university in Europe and England, do or really go to influence the government to control these people who spread venom and hate against minorities you know, I think what they need is education. They're quite ignorant of the fact that not everyone is the same. There are a few people who have great problems, I do agree. There are a few people who come, like, there are so many categories of Muslims, and to lump everyone together as one big problem is a rather mm. worry. Oh, absolutely. And, but you try, you, you try and get leading members of the English Defence League to allow themselves to be educated about Islam. Forget it. <clears throat> you have to, in a sense, you have to move to take away the fuel. Mm. 
to take to to move to take away the potential audience that the EDL appeals to. It's interesting in Denmark, my latest detailed experience, <clears throat> through the six years I was there from 2007 to 13, it was a period when the Danish People's Party was at its height. And the Danish People's Party had three planks in its policy, and one of them was anti-immigration, particularly anti-Muslim immigration. They invented all kinds of stories. They were almost as bad as the EDL in the kind of images of Islam that they portrayed. But there was, towards the end of my stays, say from about 2011, there were beginning to be <clears throat> questions raised among the intelligent public. You know, they're basically saying these right-wing nationalists are constantly banging away about this. Is that really true? So it, it begins to raise questions in their minds. And um, the joint universities organized a series of evening lectures over 11 weeks about Islam in the Middle East. Um, various academics from the main universities each contributed their session. And I suspected I ended up contributing the session on Sharia because nobody else dared. And it interests me. And the, the, the participants were the educated middle class professionals, teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, etc., etc. The ordinary, the thinking ordinary public who are basically saying they're always going on about this, that Danish People's Party. Can it really make sense that it's like that, that bad? So this course ran six times in Copenhagen and in various provincial cities. And there was me doing the Sharia lecture. I never, I, the first time I did it, I thought, I'm going to get flack for this. But I didn't. I got curious, curious questions, not throwing the ammunition of Danish People Party back at me, but questions wanting clarification, trying to understand. And over those six, we must have had about 400 people through our classes. And it was the same every time, whether it was the capital or a small provincial city. So that's one reason why I think this Islamophobia thing at the moment is a phase, because people will increasingly get to the point, hang on, it can't be right, this. And then they start investigating and... And we have a final question. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Germany has been very enlightened attitude about introducing Islamic studies. Both side of it, those denominational uh, and the other one. Uh, is it because of the population of Muslim in Germany is probably considerable compared to the European countries, I suppose. And the other is like an Amalishman and all that contributed. Uh, what is the uh, your view about the British experience on this sort of thing? Whether British <coughs> introduce some of the subject like you were mentioning in Germany? Um. Well, for a start, you couldn't do it here because there isn't that kind of central government control over university syllabuses. What universities teach, the, the, the way uh, universities work here, it's much, much more um, market led. Uh, in many European countries, including the smaller countries like Denmark, there are attempts on the part of the government to estimate how many graduates in nursing the country is going to need in six years time and we'll open so many places ditto in engineering ditto in political science there's much more central control germany is too big to micromanage like that they do macro manage um but in other ways i think there's similarities and differences between germany and britain britain has this imperial heritage 
when Muslims came to Britain, it was for many people not a new phenomenon. It was only new here. People had, and it wasn't just the imperial colonial administrator classes who had experience of Islam in Africa and South Asia and so on. It was also very often the working class um, because they had been the rank and file in the British Indian Army, in the Eighth Army in Cairo during the Second World War. Why, have, in, why in East London dialect do people take a shifty? When they want, you know, have a look, take a shifty. And a girl's called a bint. Where's that come from? It's the Eighth Army in Cairo. So the familiarity, the, 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 the encounter doesn't start from base zero. It starts from somewhere up, but it takes place in an imperial environment, power uh, in one hand and non-power in the other. Germany, at one level, doesn't have that imperial experience. Although you could argue, well, I do argue, that the German relationship with the Ottoman Empire from about 1870, 1880, was a pseudo-colonial experience. There's a very strong economic colonialism in from, uh, between Germany and the Ottoman Empire, which is why the Ottoman Empire ended up in the, uh, entering the, second, the First World War on Germany's side. But of course, Germany is also Central European. It has a history of close encounters of the third kind with the Ottoman Empire going back hundreds of years. And we're talking about Germanophone Central Europe here, not just Germany as we know it today. Vienna was besieged twice by the Ottomans. There was an Ottoman embassy in Berlin already from the 17th century. There was a Muslim cemetery in Berlin from the middle of the 19th century, catering for diplomats and merchants relating to the Ottoman, relating to the Ottoman Empire. Um, so the, 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 the Germanophone Europe was in very, and remember Germanophone Europe in those days stretched rather further east than it does today. Uh, they were already in close or near close encounter with the Ottoman Empire over centuries. And Germany doesn't have a totally negative history in relation to Islam. 18th century German literature, early 19th century German literature, was much more interested and positively interested in Islam than, it, than it's often given credit for. Goethe was not the exception. Goethe was typical of a whole generation of German <clears throat> intellectuals who were fascinated by the Ottoman Empire and Islam. So the German memory of Islam is not totally negative. And it's not a memory which, like the, uh, like the British, is one of power over non-power. It's a much more equal encounter. You could build a massive uh, discussion around that. Actually, that's a bonus question. Right. Hey, um, what did you pay him to get that question in? <laughs> nice one. I'll only take a few seconds. Um, with regards to the very last comment that you made about um, seeing a shift into the way um, Islamic studies is being taught in both um, like a, an academic setting and both new academic traditions, um, do you would you call that that shift kind of like a, um, a counter thesis of, of all the ism, isms that we've, we've, we've been taught, um, such as the ones um, mentioned in Roy Oliver's work. Um, so do you, do you, has the circle been, has the circle come to an end in essence, and is what you're, you're experiencing in, in, in Denmark, um, is this like a new opening of, of Basically, all of a sudden in academia, we're questioning everything is up for question, including the research methods. And so, are you seeing an opening of inclusion by the word? Has it proved itself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing I'm seeing that much more here in Britain than anywhere else in anywhere else in Europe. Um, but it's coming. 
other places in Europe. There's there, there are I mean Jonas can probably sign up to there are developments in this direction in Scandinavia, in Norway, Sweden, and in Denmark. There are clearly developments in Germany. Um, it's a generational thing. We Islam did come to Britain that generation earlier than the rest of Europe, more or less. Um, and because British higher education has been much more flexible than that centrally controlled system of Central Europe and Scandinavia, there's more flexibility. I mean, some of the things we stick on our syllabus in Birmingham are so as as well. So, um, my colleagues at Copenhagen horrified. The compromises we go into, compromising our, our academic rigor, um, that was one of the things that made me very uncomfortable the six years I was in Denmark and contributed to me wanting to come back to Britain. I could breathe much more freely here. Um, and then came Brexit. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's a fascinating area to be working with because it is changing. Let me finish with the, the BRACE conference, British, uh, British Association of Islamic Studies conference in Nottingham last year. It's coming here in April. Um, one morning, I came over to the start of the program after breakfast in the lobby in, outside the lecture theatre. Uh, a young Muslim woman I knew from Birmingham University, she was doing a PhD in English Lit. Um, came over to me with a mobile phone, look, and she showed me the picture of Notre Dame burning. I hadn't seen that before then, the previous evening. Notre Dame burning, and she said, isn't that dreadful? This is our heritage, heritage going up in flames. A young British Muslim saying that about Notre Dame burning. I mean, if that can happen, where can we go from there? Nice final touch there. So give them a hand. There are some programs left uh, for the upcoming series, uh, pedagogically place them here. <laughs> Just like we did when I was a tour guide, we'd place a guide at the door when the bus when the passengers left and we'd shake a handful of coins. <laughs> yep. We got a tentative date for that conference this year. Pardon? The conference you mentioned. Race? No, dates. Dates. I, don't, I, mean, I, I haven't got my diary on me, um, uh, but uh, Jonas found... can tell you. Look, and you can look up the Brace website. B R I B R A I S. Oh, British okay. Association of Islamic Studies. Islamic. It's up there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Shukran, Bibi. Love you. Alien, Stan I learned a lot. Always do. <laughs> Thanks. Nice to see nice you again. Nice to see you too. Let's get in touch, okay? Yeah, good. Hello, sir. Um, uh, would you refer any book or any book?